Uh, so Sharia really is one of the most misunderstood concepts for a lot of people when they think about Islam. And part of that has been because there was this entire negative propaganda campaign against it. Uh, and the same thing was done with other words as well, like the word jihad that we talked about in our, I believe, our second webinar series week. Uh, and what the sort of anti-Muslim hate ind industry has effectively done is to take a foreign word that nobody knows, like Sharia, and then ascribe certain horrible meanings to it and justify that horribly wrong definition with identifying certain behavior of individual sort of Muslim criminals or sort of Muslim countries that may not be following what it actually is supposed to be about. So it's so important to keep in mind a point that I made last week when we were talking about Islam and women's rights, that it's so important, let me make sure I share my screen here, it is so important for us to keep in mind that what you see happening in some Muslim majority countries or by some individual Muslims is not necessarily the same as what Islam actually teaches. And second, there's so much diversity in the Muslim population. There are almost 50 different Muslim majority countries and about 80 countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So we cannot talk about Muslims or uh, uh, Muslim states as a monolith. And as you heard in the video, Sharia really is Islamic teachings, that's all. And it literally means sort of a pathway to water, uh, a way to connect to God. And the concept of Sharia, of, of teachings from God, were given to prior prophets as well. The Torah, or Ten Commandments, to Moses, peace be upon him. The Psalms, to David, peace be upon him. The Injil, or Gospel, to Jesus, peace be upon him. Those are all part of Islamic teachings as well, because Muslims are commanded to believe in all the prior prophets and the prior revelation given to them. In fact, chapter 2, verse 136 of the Quran commands believers to even say, we have believed in God and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the descendants and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. Another important point to keep in mind is that there is no specific book of Sharia or one interpretation, whether throughout history or today. There has always been and continues to be so much diversity around interpretation of Sharia. Now, there are specific sources of Sharia, which include the Quran, the Hadith, which are sayings or teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, along with analogy and consensus of the scholars. But there's no single book of Sharia that you can point to because it's more of like an abstract concept. Like think of if I said justice, you know, there's things you can point to that sort of talk about justice, but there is no sort of one set of like rules uh, that specifically help explain justice for all times. It differs throughout history uh, and it's depending on context. So Sharia really is a set of principles or a code of ethics rather than a list of rules. And it governs all aspects of life for Muslims who seek to align their life with Islamic values or moral teachings of Islam. And this includes in marriage, divorce, finances, and then rituals such as fasting and prayer and more. And part of why Muslims love Sharia is because it grants and protects rights, rights of all people. And the human effort to try to interpret divine teachings and draw applicable rules from Sharia, from sort of God-given uh, sort of guidance is fiqh, it's, it's called fiqh. And there are books of fiqh. So there are books of sort of human interpretations of, of Sharia. This includes books on marriage, divorce, inheritance, prayer, fasting, the pilgrimage, contracts, and more. And fiqh, that human understanding, it's fallible, it's diverse, it varies with context and over time. And importantly, these rulings that are drawn by human beings from sort of Islamic teachings, they are that human attempt, they do not apply to non-Muslims. So I wanna repeat that. The interpretation or rulings of Sharia are not intended to apply to those who are not Muslim. This is because Islamic teachings or Sharia only apply to those who choose Islam as their faith traditions. And in, in Islam, there is no compulsion in religion. You cannot force somebody to believe. 
Now, I'm not saying that they won't have an impact on non-Muslims. Like for me, you know, I don't, I don't eat pork. Uh, I'm actually vegan, so I don't eat any meat. But when I go over sort of a friend's house, my decision might have an impact on them because they have to cook a different meal, for instance, right? So it could have impact on non-Muslims. And in certain Muslim majority countries, it might be hard to gamble or find alcohol or find pork even. Uh, so there could be impact on non-Muslims. But again, it's not intended to govern the behavior of non Muslims, it's specifically for governing the, the providing guidance for Muslims. And the main objectives of Sharia are to preserve human life, faith or religious freedom, our intellect, property and family. And ultimately, the goal is to achieve peace and justice, harmony and order. And one famous Muslim theologian, Imam Ibn al Qayyim, he explained really well what Sharia is really all about. And I'm gonna play this short video that I hope works out well. I came across this concise definition by one of the great classical scholars, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. He said, Sharia is based on wisdom and achieving people's welfare in this life and the afterlife. He further added, Sharia is all about justice, mercy, wisdom, and common good. Thus, any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with its opposite, common good with mischief, or wisdom with nonsense, is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia, even if it is claimed to be so according to some interpretation. So again, as Imam Al-Qaim al describes so well, Sharia is supposed to be all about just compassion, wisdom, and prosperity. And if it's not those things, then it's probably a shortcoming in human understanding or interpretation of Sharia. And when we talk about Sharia for Muslims in sort of our daily life, the way it applies are things like, you know, our, our daily religious practices, uh, like praying or fasting during Ramadan, dietary rules like prohibition on alcohol and pork, commands to be kind to our neighbors, to give in charity, to serve those in need, and, and really to work to bring benefit to society. There are commands to honor parents. And I have to tell you, this is something that actually exists in the Quran. There is a commandment that we are not supposed to even say uff to our parents. That, that literally shows up in the Quran. And I'll tell you, that's a challenge. But that is part of Sharia, right? It's tough, but it's there. And for Muslims living their religious principles, it means not investing their money in unethical ways. That's, this includes for Muslims in gambling or pornography or, you know, a, a warfare in a way that harms people. This is like ethical investing. There are also financial limitations like restrictions on interest, which is why there's this whole industry of what's called Sharia compliant investments or mortgages to avoid the prohibition on interest. And that prohibition is really to avoid the gross inequity between the haves and the have nots. Um, that sort of interest uh, leads to that we even see in our country, uh, sort of the, uh, the, the great divide, the wealth gap that we see. And in the legal context, Sharia could have application on business contracts and in matters of marriage, divorce, inheritance, child custody, uh, child support, alimony, and so much more. There is also, of course, a penal code or punishment system as part of Sharia. But there are over 6,000 verses in the Quran, and less than 15 of them speak about any kind of sort of punishment. So it's less than one page. And even for any of uh, sort of the punishments to apply, there are multiple dozens of very strict conditions that have to be met. And jurists or rulers are supposed to bend over backwards to find any excuse not to apply any punishment because the purpose is mercy. Mercy is such an important component of the law. And every legal system has a punishment system. It's part of a checks and balances, but nobody is allowed to take the law into their own hands through any kind of vigilante justice or anything like that. You need to have sort of a due process of law. You need to have recognized courts who can actually hear sort of different positions. So vigilante justice is absolutely prohibited. Uh, Dr. Sabil Ahmed, he gave a great analogy. He said, imagine if, you know, if aliens came from Mars and they asked, what is the US constitution? And I responded by saying the US Constitution kills people by capital punishment. And then I went on to describe lethal injections or hangings or electrocution. 
Would that be a fair representation of what the US Constitution is? Of course not. It focuses on just a tiny piece of it and ignores the breadth and beauty of our Constitution. It ignores the majority and focuses on a tiny piece that only applies when certain strict conditions are met, including due process of law. And the same thing is true with Sharia. Only a tiny portion of Islamic laws related to crime and punishment, and the rest really speaks about things like respecting neighbors, honoring parents, being good to our fellow uh, Americans or people of any background, being good to minorities, you know, education, enhancing society, charity, all of these things. And different countries approach the implementation of Sharia differently. Some don't have it at all as part of their legal code. Some have it in some way, but not others. And there's no one way of interpreting things. And I wanna play this video that sort of goes a little bit into that very briefly. Law usually refers to the public here, but most of the Sharia's rulings are about private spiritual practice, such as prayer, fasting, charity, and so on. And while rulings on social relations from marriage, divorce, sales, contracts, and inheritance remain a living part of the Sharia, their implementation in modern societies varies from country to country. Sometimes it is based purely on personal conviction, as in the case of American Muslims voluntarily giving to charity or following Islamic finance laws. Importantly, very few of the areas of behavior and social relations that the Sharia governs have only a single rule on which all jurists agree. Scholars always accepted and recognized reasonable disagreement because interpretation could rarely provide complete certainty about God's intentions. Yet this did not mean that anyone could just impose their own understanding of God's law on others, especially through force. While the Sharia also encompasses certain rulings on civil procedure, aspects of crime and punishment, and even warfare, only public authorities could establish courts with the power to enforce Sharia rulings. Today, this has changed in a number of ways. In nations where Muslims are minorities, such as the United States, Muslim scholars emphasize that the Sharia makes it obligatory for Muslims to follow the secular laws of the lands where they live. In many Muslim-majority countries, it is now the state alone, and not scholars who specialize in the Sharia, that decides what will be enforced in courts. And the state's rules are completely divorced from the sophisticated methods and culture of traditional scholars. So when we say that some modern states apply the Sharia, we need to remember that states may have picked and chosen certain rulings, but isolated rules alone don't represent the meaning and spirit of the Sharia. But this is what is still true for Muslims today. They see the Sharia as primarily about finding the path to God and about making this world an abode of justice. In other words, for Muslims, the Sharia is about protecting the most important human interests and values, life, religion, wealth, reason, family, and honor. So when a Muslim says she follows Sharia, that just means she refers to these rules as she lives her life. Does that mean she wants that to become the law of the land for everyone? No, not at all. She would actually be violating Sharia if that's what she was seeking. Unfortunately, that's not what we see or hear, particularly with a, an active effort by the anti-Muslim industry, which has tried to promote a very different and ugly divisive narrative. And they've used Sharia as a way, as a boogeyman to sort of you know, create fear and division. And they've done this to sort of maximize the sort of fear and otherness of Islam and Muslims. Over a decade ago, some of the more sophisticated groups actually started shifting their rhetoric from any kind of directly anti-Muslim sort of rhetoric to anti-Sharia as sort of a backdoor way to actually be anti-Muslim. Right, because ultimately people have rights, ideas do not. And anti-Sharia can feel like a logical, rational policy. It seems to resist uh, some scary sounding terms that again, they attribute horrible things to. And this, this is sort of uh, presented as a way to get support, even though if you directly came out and admitted what you're saying when you say you're anti-Sharia is that you're against Muslims having the freedom of religion in our country. This is why it's so important for us when we speak about these kinds of sort of misinformation out there to really address it as sort of anti-Muslim efforts, not just anti-Sharia. And the harsh penal codes that have been associated with Sharia, they're often fabricated or misinterpreted or decontextualized, again, for a very specific purpose, fear mongering and division. Or they take instances of people acting in a criminal fashion to help support their sort of views of what Sharia is. And this sort of shift, of, instead of being directly anti-Muslim to sort of bringing up even well-researched terminology, like literally the words creeping Sharia, 
that was researched and used to directly talk about Muslims. And that fear even infiltrated our legal and political systems, unfortunately. Since 2010, lawmakers in over 40 states introduced bills aimed at directly attacking Sharia. Some of those bills listed Sharia by name, but others referred more broadly to religious or cultural laws that would go against the fundamental liberties, rights, and privileges granted under the US and state constitutions. And bills like this that they've actually passed in 14 states, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. <clears throat> when you look at this, you might think, okay, well, hey, a great number of them didn't pass, that's wonderful. But something to keep in mind is that each one of these bills, whether it passed or it didn't, is a direct statement that Muslims should not have the same right to exercise their religion that every other person has in our country. And these bills are entirely unnecessary. They typically include a clause, again, prohibiting foreign law in American courts if it conflicts with the US Constitution, for instance. But that already, already is the case. We don't need a law to tell us that because the Constitution itself has a supremacy clause that denies any kind of authority to any foreign law or any kind of law that conflicts with it. So these bills are entirely unnecessarily. And our Constitution is already adequate to protect us from any other law taking over because the Constitution is the supreme law of the land in our country. And in response, to sort of the, this huge increase of anti-Sharia laws being introduced in so many different places, the American Bar Association even published a formal letter opposing these bills as unnecessary and raising concerns about them. And those concerns are valid because these are attacks, again, on the religious freedom of American Muslims. They are dangerous as they are a threat to religious freedom for all of us. And by explicitly singling out Muslims, they're used as a tactic, again, for division and fear-mongering and demonizing and discriminating. They promote anti-Muslim bigotry, hate, and even violence, unfortunately. So in essence, that anti-Sharia movement, it was a campaign to create fear and spread misinformation. And the main guy behind the anti-Sharia legislation, David uh, Yarushalmi, he even admitted that what he was seeking was that friction, that sort of, you know, people talking about this, not that the actual bills were necessary or would do anything. He said, if this thing passed in every state without any friction, it would have not served its purpose. The purpose was heuristic, to get people asking this question, what is Sharia? That's what he was trying to achieve. So supposedly in the name of protecting our US constitution, what these anti-Sharia bills actually do is strip me as an American Muslim and, and sort of millions of other American Muslims of their right to religious freedom. And that is actually shredding our constitutional values. American Muslims only request that the law recognize their right to apply religious rules to their own lives. And in fact, as I said before, it would go against Sharia to apply those rules to someone who is not Muslim. And those who are religious of any background, they should be the ones who are most concerned with these kinds of efforts to restrict the practice of religious teachings. And let me give you a quick example of what it means to have courts consider, you know, Islamic teachings that would be important to Muslims. When Muslims marry, I mentioned this uh, last week, uh, the man is obligated to promise a, a, a gift or a certain sum of money to the woman. It's sort of like a prenuptial agreement. And as we discussed last week, that money belongs entirely to the woman herself. She can do anything that she wants with it. Now, while we might have hope that this union of this couple is gonna succeed and last forever, if the guy turns out to be a deadbeat, the woman should be able to go to court and get what was actually promised to her. If the court says, oh, this contract is based on Islamic teaching, so we can't look at it, we're actually taking away the protections that Islam directly grants to women. And this is something that exists in other, with other uh, faith traditions as well. Like the Jewish community, they have similar religious laws called halakha that are considered by courts. But again, they cannot trump the, the US constitution and they have to abide by concepts like public policy and everything else. It's a normal part of our legal system. But unfortunately, the anti-Muslim hate groups, they were a full blast in presenting the sort of Muslim version of this as somehow different and a threat to all of us when that is not the case. And the campaign that built sort of that fear and spread that was very active. In 2017, Act for America, 
the largest anti-Muslim group in our country, even organized rallies in cities across our country, including in Seattle, against Sharia. And these rallies were intended, again, to stoke fear and promote dangerous stereotypes about Muslims. I remember being at the one in Seattle, and this is a picture from, from me there in, Se uh, in the Seattle one. And even though the people there were against Sharia and they seemed to hate and fear it, they didn't even know what it was. And the only example, there was a reporter that went to and spoke to so many people there who were showing up against Sharia and asking them, give me an example of what this creeping Sharia is. Give me an example of how you see it happening. The only example that he was able to get, and he told me this when he came and spoke with me, the only example that somebody was able to provide is that community swimming pools have women only hours. That's the extent of you know, Sharia creeping into our lives. And again, that, those women only hours are not just for Muslims, it's for everybody. Uh, and it was just like bizarre that this is the only thing that people could identify because there actually is no threat of this. But sadly, that scary boogeyman, even though it's been exposed in a lot of ways, it is still used to target and attack American Muslims. There's even sort of, for instance, uh, tests of loyalty that are used with this, with elected leaders. Uh, there are elected leaders in our state who were sent uh, an email by anti-Muslim folks asking them to disclaim Sharia and you know, pledge their allegiance to the US Constitution instead, again, completely missing that the Sharia commands us to uphold the Constitution. There are polls that people, sh uh, that anti-Muslim groups or individuals use to say, oh, look at those Muslims, they're scary. They, they don't support, you know, whatever by pointing out polls where Muslims say they support Sharia. Well, again, as a Christian, a Christian is gonna say they support Christian teachings. As a Muslim, Muslims are gonna say they support Islamic teachings. But there's this attempt to describe those who do support Islamic teachings and they're Muslim as somehow un-American. And that is completely wrong and has horrible consequences on everyday Muslim youth, students, uh, adults, women being attacked with head coverings and more. So I wanna close with some facts that are based on research and data from, the, from ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Fact, the majority of Muslims in America, they're US citizens, 86%. Fact, there's stronger, the stronger that a Muslim's religious identity is, the stronger their American identity is as well, 91% versus 68%. And this data directly challenges the myth that the Americanness and Muslimness of an individual are mutually exclusive. That is not the case at all. Fact. Let's see if I can. Okay, sorry, that top part is showing. Fact. Frequent mosque attendance is also linked to greater civic engagement in our country. When whether that engagement is cooperating in the community to address problems or registering to vote or planning to vote. Fact, religion is very important in the daily lives of Muslims compared to other religious groups, second only to white evangelicals. However, Muslims do not seek to impose their religion on others. They are actually very high on private engagement over here, Muslims, very high on private engagement, but lower on public engagement compared to other groups. In fact, the groups that, the groups that seek to establish religious law in our country uh, the most are not Muslims. Muslims do not, the majority of Muslims, I should say, do not want religious law as a source of law for anybody. Bottom line, if we wanna protect religious freedom for all, we must stand against these efforts that seek to demonize Islam and Muslims and doing so by upholding our constitutional principles, including the foundational freedom of, of religion and religious pluralism without discriminating against any specific religion. Thank you very much.